DC, or Detective Comics, was founded in May of 1934, but wasn't officially named DC Comics until 1977. So, what was it called for all of the time in between? And why did it take them so long to change it? I mean, Detective Comics, Batman, it was right there the whole time. Come on, DC, get it together. If you are on this channel, you probably know a little bit about DC Comics and its 80 plus years of history producing original comic stories of super guys and bat persons. But you may not know the history behind the scenes at DC and its many other names. Hey, hold on. I'm the guy who talks about comic book names around here. You go back to tackling your misconceptions. Um, how long has it been since you tackled an actual misconception, by the way? It's just the name of the show, okay? I like puns. I know, I know. So do I. But so long as we're talking about names, I feel like I could help out a little bit. I'll allow it. But Honestly, how much could there be to this story? I mean, we have to go back right to the beginning of comic books, so like... 82 years? And that's a lot to cover, so let's get to it. What would be known as DC Comics was founded by a daring entrepreneur and pulp writer by the name of Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson under the name National Allied Publications. He founded the company with the new vision to create all new original material instead of reprinting past comic strips, which is what the very first line of comic books ever did. With this newfangled idea of his, he began to produce comic books for the next three years. In this time, he published America's first all-original comic book, New Fun. This was a big deal because up to this point, all comic book publications had been reprints of comic book strips found in the funny section in various syndicated newspapers. He followed that with new comics and finally Detective Comics. But the journey was not easy. In order to publish Detective Comics, Malcolm had to take on an experienced publishing partner named Harry Donenfeld. Now here's where it gets fun. In 1937, Malcolm and Donenfeld, along with accountant Jack Leibowitz, founded Detective Comics Inc. But the relationship didn't last long. As comics historian Gerard Jones explains in his book Men of Tomorrow, the year after their partnership, Donenfeld arranged for Malcolm and his wife to go on a cruise to think up some ideas on how to work past their financial decline, only to return home to discover the locks to his office had been changed and he'd been sued by his partner for non-payment resulting in the loss of his company. After all of that nonsense, Malcolm called it quits on the entire comics industry. And that's four years of history. Alrighty, only 78 more. Shortly after, all ownership of National Allied Publications, NAP for short, and Detective Comics Incorporated transferred to Donenfeld and his partner Leibowitz. NAP was merged with Detective Comics, whose name was pushed into the background as a subsidiary of the new company. They also removed the Allied from NAP to become simply National Publications, or sometimes National Comics. Yeah, uh, you're about to see a pattern in this next bit. In enters the official father of the American comic book, Max Gaines, which just sounds Sounds like the name of a Silver Age bodybuilding superhero. Now, Gaines was called the father of the American comic because even though Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson created the first all original American comic, Gaines is actually the man credited with creating the first American comic book period, with 1933's Famous Funnies, A Carnival of Comics. Though this comic book was exclusively reprints of newspaper funnies, it served to prepare us for what we would see as the modern comic book format. After this venture, Gaines formed his own comic book publication company in 1938 and found funding with none other than Donenfeld himself. This new company, All American Comics, became a sister company to National Publication, with Gaines as the primary shareholder and Leibowitz as a minor partner. Shortly after, All American Comics introduced some of our most beloved titles such as The Flash, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, and many other Golden Age favorites. All-American frequently lent a lot of these characters to national publications in exchange for the ability to use some of National's characters, even releasing some titles under the unofficial DC logo to help said titles ride on the success of Batman's popularity in Detective Comics. This whole transaction was not done by accident, however. Donenfeld had made Leibowitz a partner in All-American Comics, leaving Gaines stuck with National and unable to work with other publishers. I can't feel too bad about this though. Gaines was widely reported as a loud, angry, and aggressive man with reports from his own son, William, that he would viciously beat him with a belt while shouting, you will never amount to anything. As the relationship with Donenfeld began to turn sour, Gaines removed DC's unofficial logo from his publications and no longer used national characters. Finally, in 1944, Gaines accepted an offer from Donenfeld to buy out his share of all American comics, and he went his own way, later opening his own publication company called EC Comics, or Educational Comics, but we'll get back to that. This move left Donenfeld as the owner of all three companies, which he merged into one called National Comics Publications, or NCP for short. And there we have it. The company that will eventually change its name to DC Comics is now formed from three sister companies into one. And this all happened in the 1940s. 
Hard part's done. Despite all the name swapping, NCP had been branding itself as Superman DC since 1940. Ironically, NCP protected its titles and character names fiercely by pursuing lawsuits for copyright infringement as rival companies experienced success. An example of this can be seen in Scott's episode explaining who owns the rights to Captain of Marvel. You can check that out right after this. An important thing to note here, superhero comics and the industry as a whole flourished during its golden age. During World War II, the comics were as much propaganda as entertainment, promoting the soldiers overseas as supermen, encouraging Americans at home to keep up the war effort, even shipping comic titles overseas that were specifically geared towards soldiers for the purpose of boosting morale. A after the war ended in 1945, soldiers returning home continued buying comics out of habit, and the industry received a temporary boost in sales. But that did not last long, as these superhero comics struggled for a voice without a depression or a war to give them direction. Presumably, Americans just got tired of all the fighting. They didn't need their entertainment to constantly remind them of that stress. They needed to take a break. In response, companies began canceling a large number of their costume hero titles and tried their hand at other publications, such as All-Star Western, House of Mystery, and many other titles I don't have the time to list. But if we go back to EC on August 20th, 1947, Max Gaines, the man who helped us create NCP Comics with his All-Star Comics contribution, was killed in a motorboating accident. With his death, the company transferred to his son, William Games, or Bill for short. You remember, the kid who would never amount to anything? At that time, Educational Comics had been making its name publishing comic book adaptations of Bible stories. But it wasn't long after that change in ownership that Bill Gaines had decided to go a different direction with the company and rebranded EC as Entertaining Comics. With this change in name, EC started to produce comics that ranged from science fiction to satire. But Bill really found his niche when he pioneered the genre of horror comics with books like Tales from the Crypt. He found a lot of success in these new titles and was off and running for a time. In 1954, the infamous Attack on Comics came about, and NCP EC, along with many other publishers, came into accusations of corrupting America's youth, forcing many comics publishers out of business. The book that started the movement, Dr. Frederick Wortham's Seduction of the Innocent, asserted that the violence, drug use, and crime seen in comic books had and would continue to promote similar behaviors in young readers who would look to imitate these stories. I made a whole video about it right here. EC, and more specifically, Specifically, its horror comics came under some of the strongest accusations. Bill himself was demonized in the public eye for his testimony at a hearing with the Senate Subcommittee for Juvenile Delinquency, where he unapologetically defended his belief that there was no way that his comics, Blood, Violence, and Monsters Considered, were corrupting the youth, instead taking the stance that everything he had printed was in good taste and meant for people of sound mind, for the purpose of affordable entertainment. The Comics Code Authority, or CCA, was founded that same year, and Gaines had refused to take part in this for a time, as he had already cancelled his horror comics and considered it ridiculous that he would need approval for his new line of clean, realistic stories. The backlash from distributors drove him to bankruptcy, and by the time he had accepted the Comics Code Authority, no one would sell his comic. Now because of this, EC shut down all of their comic book titles, except for one, which had made the transition into a particular magazine, but more on that in a future video. Years later, in 1960, Gaines sold to Kinney Parking Company. Remember that name. Now, the Comics Code Authority is important to us because after this, NCP felt they had to change everything. This change started with the 1956 release of Showcase Number no. 4, which had premiered a new version of the previously published superhero, The Flash. This new character, Barry Allen, was given powers through a lab accident and, after discovering that he now had super speed, took on the name of his favorite comic book superhero, ushering in what is known as the Silver Age of Comics. DC continued to completely overhaul their classics such as The Green Lantern, Hawkman, and updated versions of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, bringing superhero comics back into popularity. Five years later, in 1961, Donenfeld passed on and his son, Erwin Donenfeld, took over for NCP and the name of the company changed once more to National Periodical Publications, now NPP for short. The next big change for NPP came in 1969 when they were purchased by Kinney National, an entertainment company who also bought Warner Brothers that same year and, if you remember, Bill Gaines' company nine years prior. This is why all DC movies are released through Warner Brothers. Unlike Marvel Comics, who were, at the time, forced to license some of their intellectual properties to different film studios over the years. Shortly after, Kinney National was involved in a price-fixing scandal and separated its entertainment fixtures from its non-entertainment fixtures to become Warner Communications and National Kinney Corporation respectively. Through these ownership transitions, NPP kept her name, though still branded the unofficial name of DC or DC Comics. And enters Jeanette Khan. Khan! 
With the success of three magazine launches and a Harvard degree under her belt, she was made NPP's editor in 1976. History had its eyes on her. Right away, in an effort to revitalize the company, Khan revamped NPP in 1977 by finally giving it the name it had been asking for all along, DC Comics. This revamp also came with an official new logo and a pay structure that granted royalties to artists and creators. And there you go, DC Comics is now official and Khan's hard work served to pioneer the modern comic book company from creator compensation to release schedules and everything in between. She was swiftly made president of DC Comics and editor-in-chief and went down in history as the first lady of comics. Now for a quick note on the current meaning of DC Comics. For quite some time, it was a branding tool for the company in order to ride the success of the Detective Comics title, but it's taken on a life and meaning of its own. Much like the SATs, the acronym used to mean something, but now it's just the name. So yes, DC still technically stands for Detective Comics, but this has been meaningless for quite some time, as the company has gained popularity and no longer needs to promote itself based off of the success of that one title. It is completely acceptable to say DC Comics, even though some folks might annoyingly point out that it's redundant since you're effectively saying Detective Comics Comics. It's not really redundant because it's not really an acronym anymore. It's a long and interesting history, but we got there. Now, we didn't cover the full 82 years, but after the name change, some big acquisitions and brand changes happened. Here are a few honorable mentions. The creation of the Vertigo comic book line, which debuted as a DC Comics imprint in 1989. DC created Vertigo to publish more mature titles for their adult audience. DC Comics also acquired the Wildstorm universe in 1999, which originally had been founded by none other than acclaimed comic book artist Jim Lee. And of course, the recent The New 52 reboot, where they attempted to rebrand the universe to make it appealing to new readers. There's tons more info we couldn't fit into this video. We've got some books that you might want to check out in the description below, including Ron Goulart's Great History of American Comics and Gerard Jones's Men of Tomorrow, Geeks, Gangsters, and the Birth of the Comic Book, which were great tools for a large portion of this research. I, for one, can't wait to tackle Marvel's history next. <sighs> Question, what do you think of the name DC Comics? Do you still think it's redundant? Do any of its previous names sound better to you? If you had to create a new name for DC Comics, what would it be? Let us know in the comments. Thanks again for hanging out with us, DK. You do a show about names and comics that's somewhat less confusing than this video. It's called Alter Ego, right? Yes, and we have a new episode coming out on Friday right here on NerdSync about the Winter Soldier. But you lovely nerds can actually watch it early by clicking this annotation or the super secret link in the description. Ooh, do I make a cameo in that video? Nope. Fantastic, you can also click right here to watch that video about who owns the name Captain Marvel. It's a fun one and involves a wacky character who can detach his arms and legs if memory serves. I don't know, it was like over a year ago. If this is your first time hanging out with us here at NerdSync, make sure you hit that big sexy subscribe button so you don't miss out on all the new videos we make for you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday that explore the history, science, art, and philosophy behind your favorite comic book superheroes. My name is Scott. And I'm DK, reminding you to read between the panels and grow smarter through comics. See ya.